I long ago left Egypt for the promised land. I trusted in my Savior and to his guiding hand. He led me out to victory through the great Red Sea. I sang a song of triumph and shouted, I am free. You need not look for me down in Egypt's sand. For I have pitched my tent far up into the land. You need not look for me down in Egypt's sand. For I have pitched my tent far up into the land. I followed close behind him, and the land soon found. I did not hold or tremble, for pain and I was bound. My God I fully trusted, and he led me in. I shouted hallelujah, my heart is free from sin. You need not look for me down in Egypt's sand. For I have pitched my tent far up in the land. You need not look for me down in Egypt's sand. For I have pitched my tent far up in the land. I started for the highlands where the fruits abound. I pitched my tent near Hebron for grants of us gold brown. With wind and honey flowing and new wine so free. I have no love for Egypt, and has no charm for me. You need not look for me down in Egypt's sand. For I have pitched my tent far up in the land. You need not look for me down in Egypt's sand. For I have pitched my tent far up in the land. My heart is so enraptured as I press along. Each day I find new blessings would fill my heart with song. I'm ever marching onward to that land on high. Someday I'll reach my mansion that's built in the sky. You need not look for me down in Egypt's sand. For I have pitched my tent far up into the land. You need not look for me down in Egypt's sand. For I have pitched my tent for a big new land. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. That we're not down in the sand anymore, God. We're up in Beulah Land. And God, one day we're going to the eternal Beulah Land. Thank you, Lord, for that. And I pray you just to come back and get us even today. Uh, Lord, if you don't have us to occupy till you come, and thank you, Lord, for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To spread the tiny ground wherever man is found. Oh, spread the tiny ground wherever man is found. Wherever human hearts and human voice abound. Let Proclaim the joyful sound, the Comforter has come. The Comforter has come, the Comforter has come, the Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father promised him. Oh, spread the tiny ground, wherever man is found, the Comforter.
that is to be cleansed. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and the priest shall offer the sin offering and make an atonement for him that is to be cleansed for his uncleanness, and afterwards he shall kill the burnt offering, and the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the meat offering upon the altar, and the priest shall make an atonement for him, and he shall be clean. Heavenly Father, help us now as we realize that Jesus came to save the sin-sick soul and heal our sin-sick souls. And Lord, thank you. Remember the day that my sin-sick soul got healed, God. And I pray that uh, those of us that are saved will remember that. And God, we can go and take this passage and teach others what you said about, uh, God, uh, the, the cleansing of someone that's a sinner like, like the leper was, God. Uh, and I pray you help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Now, the word leper is used in the Bible 17 times. The, the plural lepers is used six times. Leprosy, however, which is the disease of a leper, is used 39 times in the Bible. That's an awful lot. Um, there's a couple times in the Old Testament where lepers got healed. And there's also a couple times where God gave leprosy to people that were misbehaving. Um, but when Jesus came, he had the God-given power of healing lepers. And the first time in history, people could go to someone and they could be completely clean of their leprosy. Um, in the Old Testament, one of the examples we have, the only Gentile uh, in the Old Testament that spoken of as having leprosy, is the captain of the Syrian army, uh, Naaman, and he was healed in uh, 2 uh, Kings 5, um, and I doubt he went to the temple and did all this stuff we just read, he probably went back home. Uh, Leviticus 14 gives instructions for the Jews to do after they uh, had an event, so I, I doubt the, the priests had, had much practice doing this in Jesus' day. Uh, they certainly got proficient at it by the end of his ministry because uh, every time they turn around, here comes this guy that used to be a leper and Jesus and healed him. Uh, they had ten guys at once, remember. Um, you see, leprosy was a strange disease. It was used as a punishment by God. And because of that, it is a picture of the curse of sin. And as it turns out, only God can heal leprosy. Now I realize they had treatments for what they call Hansen's disease nowadays, which is what the Bible describes when it's describing leprosy. But that's because God helped somebody have that cure. I don't believe that people invent cures just out of their own human brain. I believe God deals with them and God gives them the knowledge. And we live in a blessed time. Do you realize how many diseases and things they can treat nowadays that they used to not treat? Look, back in the old days, somebody got cancer. You didn't have chemo. You didn't have radiation. You parked someone in bed and died. Sometimes very horribly and very, very painfully. But leprosy was so bad that the Bible told the lepers to get somewhere else and stay away from the rest of the site. It was highly contagious. Sin is highly contagious. But God put these instructions in Leviticus chapter 13 and chapter 14. Talks, 13 talks about uh, all the symptoms of leprosy in the house and it's got leprosy in it and stuff and what you're supposed to do. Then in 14 it talks about what to do when the leper comes and he's been cleansed. Like I said, it didn't happen very often. Uh, let's look at some things here. First of all, notice that there was a spiritual offering of the lambs and the different things. A blood atonement had to be made for this disease. Now, other diseases in the Old Testament you didn't have to have a sacrifice for, but leprosy you did. That's why we know it's a type of sin. Look, there can be all things, all kinds of things wrong with a person. Sometimes a person gets an impediment of some time. Sometimes it's physical. 
Some people get speech impediments. Some people uh, have uh, maybe are, are mentally developed like somebody else, or maybe uh, you know when they were born something happened uh, and, and they have uh, you know uh, deficiency there. Uh, and, and you know we've learned to take care of those people and and uh, you know make their life as fulfilling as they can be. Uh, we have medicine to treat some of this stuff. Uh, but back in the Old Testament, you got this leprosy thing, and you had to come to the tabernacle once you got clean. If God healed you for some reason, you had to go and you had to do this sacrifice. Uh, in verse number 10, very directly it tells you that you were put up by the priest for eight days in the first ten ver nine verses, and then on the eighth day, he checked you out. If you were okay, you got the sacrifices together and you took them and you sacrificed them. Uh, Matthew um, chapter number 8 talks about this. Uh, verse 3 says, And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said unto him, See, uh, thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony under that. Now, there's something interesting here in Leviticus 14, because in verse 21 through 22, we have a, a, a different set of offerings. They're for the poor people to bring them. And I imagine more poor lepers brought in 22, in 21 and 22 brought that offering than they did the first one. Uh, notice what it says. It says, and if he be poor and cannot get so much, then he shall take one lamb for a trespass offering to be waived to make an atonement for him, and one tenth deal of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering, and a log of oil. I guess the log of oil was cheap. And two turtle doves and two pigeons, birds are cheap. And as he is able to get, and one shall be a sin offering, and the other a burnt offering. So we see that, and look. If, if you're cut off from society and you have to go to the streets yelling, unclean, 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 you're not going to have much of a job. You're probably not going to have very much money. And chances are, if you do get cleansed, you're going to be doing this second one and not the first one. Because it's just the nature of things. But there are people in the Bible, like Naaman was a ruler, uh, there were some other, one of the priests got leprosy. You know, they had money. They, they did the first one. But there's a lot of poor people in the New Testament. Jesus healed. They probably had to go, this poor guy in Matthew chapter 8, that's probably what he did. He went down there and got the turtle loves and the one lamb and, and did the thing. Um, God knows no class distinction when it comes to sin, folks. Everybody's a sinner. Whether they're rich or poor, fat or skinny, no matter what race they are, where they come from, uh, what language they speak, uh, we're all sinners. We're all sinners. The poor man's offering, well, you know, it tells me that God makes allowances for all kinds of sinners. He wants everybody to be saved, so he, he makes a way. Even, even in this, he made a way. Now, true, they had to, you know, go do something that was part of the law. Oh, uh, Leviticus 13, verse 45, uh, talks about uh, the leper. Um, and the leper in whom the plague is, it was a plague. So usually when it came, more than one person got it. His clothes shall be rent, and his head bare, and he shall put a covering on his upper lip. So they wore something so their spit didn't touch people. Because their spit was contagious. And shall cry, unclean, unclean, all the days wherein the plague shall be in him. He shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone without the camp. Shall his habitation be. So this guy couldn't even come to town and do anything. And if he did, he had to walk on the other side of the street and yell, unclean, unclean. Oh, what a life. How would you like to go down the uh, Walmart and go through the aisle and say, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, stay away from me. That's what it was like. 
Don't touch me. I'm unclean. That must have been horrible. Horrible. Uh, but even even buildings got leprosy. Uh, we're not going to look it up. I've got it on your page there. But I put Leviticus 4, 44 through 45. And, and, and they would, if leprosy uh, got in a building, they would tear the building down. That's how serious this disease was. Dwight L. Moody uh, once said, uh, the great trouble is that people take everything in general and do not take it to themselves. In other words, the preacher get up and say, you're a sinner, people are sinners. And they, and they never say, well, I'm a sinner. They try to just spread it around to everybody but them. Uh, suppose a man should say to me, Moody, there's a man in Europe who died last week and left $5 million to a certain individual. Well, I say I don't doubt that, but it's rather a common thing to happen. I don't think any more about it, but suppose he says he left the money to you. Then I pay attention. Now, wouldn't I? I would say, to me? He would say, yes, to you. I become suddenly interested. I want to know all about it. So we are apt to think Christ died for sinners. He died for everybody. And for nobody in particular is what people think. But when the truth comes to me that eternal life is mine and all the glories of heaven are mine, I begin to be interested. Where is the chapter and verse where it says I can be saved? I put myself among sinners and I take my place of sinners. And then that salvation is mine. And I am sure of it for time and eternity. That's how people get saved. They have to come as sinners. I had to come as a sinner. And, and God's, God's made the offering for us. And you don't have to come every week or every month and bring lamb after lamb or, or turtle dove after turtle dove or anything like that. You come like the leper. This, this offering was made once. Once! It's, it's a good type of Christ. What does that old song say? Once for all? The blood, secondly, not only did it have to be an offering, but the blood had to be applied. It was very interesting how the blood was applied. It was sprinkled on the altar, and then it was put in a uh, dish or something. Uh, they wouldn't put blood on their hands. Um... And they would put it on the thumb of the right hand. The thumb. Now, you ever play, you know, the little, little kitty game, Mr. Thumbkin? You know, hands, we're good at what we do because we have what? Posable thumbs. Makes us different from animals. We can do things. So a thumb is a picture of what? What you do. What you do. The things that you craft. Things that you pick up. The things that you buy with your money. You, you all handle them with your hands. Deuteronomy 31, 29 says, For I know after my death ye will utterly corrupt yourselves. This is Moses talking. And turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger to the work of what? The work of your hands. There you go. Your sinful deeds have to be cleansed. God, God when he saves you, he cleanses your deeds. All those despicable, evil thoughts, clean them away. All the things you did, all the places you went, uh, the, the bad feelings you had in your heart, he, he, the things you do, he washed away. He put it on the big toe. Well, that's not hard to figure out. That's where, where you go has to be cleansed. Because sometimes as sinners, we go, we go bad places. We go bad places. Proverbs 6, 28 and 29. 
Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? <laughs> I don't want to walk on hot coals. Yeah, I know some of these uh, uh, Indian gurus, you know, they walk on hot coals, but, uh, you know, I'm, they probably have calluses this thick on the bottom of their feet. I don't know what they do. They put themselves in some kind of trance or something or use acupuncture. I don't know what they do. But you, mo most normal people, uh, you walk on a hot coal, you're going to know it. You're going to be going out, ooch, ouch, 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 and uh, jumping up and down, looking for the Bengay, or not the Bengay, but the, what's that stuff called they used to spray on things? Anyway, the burn, the burn, the burn stuff. Verse 29 says, So he that goeth unto his neighbor's wife, who's ever toucheth her, shall not be innocent. Notice that the hands are involved in verse 29. I won't elaborate it anymore. But, uh, you know, <coughs> the thumb and the, the big toes, what you do, where you go when you do that thing. And it's not always good. Uh, you know, God burns a lot of sinful places in the Bible. That's how bad some of them are. Sodom and Gomorrah, bad place. Burn them out. I don't know. Maybe he sent meteors from the sky. We're not sure exactly what happened, but he destroyed them. They were no more. Matter of fact, uh, they've just now found some ruins around the, in the, around the Dead Sea. They think that's where Sodom and Gomorrah was. The Bible seems to indicate that. And they think that's what caused the Dead Sea. I mean, the Dead Sea is so salty, no, nothing can live in it. Hmm. That's interesting. And then he put he put it on the tip of the ear. Now, I don't know about you, but see, this is the round part of the ear. There's only we, we call it the earlobe. So he put some blood on the earlobe. It's what you hear or listen to. Well, you know, in the modern age, that's real important. Because we got the TV, we got the radio, we got we got advertisements in the store and, you know, music and, you know, just think of all the things you hear just by accident of the day. You hear a lot of stuff. Some stuff you don't want to hear mm -hmm. as a Christian. You need that cleanse. You can just be standing around and sin be sinful if you really try hard enough. Sometimes when you don't try hard enough. Isaiah 6, 10 says, Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes and they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. That's a gut punishment on people that are doing what they shouldn't do, going where they shouldn't go and hearing stuff they shouldn't hear. God may put curse on them so that they're cursed to do that stuff. I thank God that he separates us from our sin, don't you? Um, This fellow that wrote this little article, I think it was D.L. Moody that said all this. Um, a lot of my illustration books, there's a lot of Moody stuff. And he says, I never knew the real significance of those words. I will blot them out of the book of remembrance forever. Until I was preaching for Brother James Morris at the 5th and Walnut Streets Methodist Church in Louisville, Kentucky. After my sermon... Brother Morris got up and told of the sin of his early years, how that he had been a gambler and a drunkard and a sinner in the sight of God. While he was talking, I looked over at his old mother who was in the congregation. She was twisting and turning, and it seemed to me that she could not control herself. She seemed to go to pieces like a jointed snake. I'm not sure about a jointed snake. When he sat down and the service was dismissed, she ran up to the preacher, threw his arms around his neck, and said, Jimmy, I guess it wasn't uh, one of the booty that was preaching. Uh, he said, Jimmy, what made you say that? What made you say you were a gambler and a drunkard? I know you've always been a good kid and a good man. That old precious mother had forgotten that her boy had ever been a sinner. I said, glory to God. Though sunk in the depths of sin, God not only forgives us, but he blots our sins out of the book of remembrance forever. 
Boy, that's something. Mama forgot all these sinful days. Only remember for preaching. That, that's a good testimony right there. But that's what Jesus does to us. All that sin in our past lives, when we confess it before the Lord after we get saved, God forgets that stuff. That's why it's important to confess your sin. Then we have the anointing. The blood was put on the earlobe, was put on the thumb, was put on the big toe. And then after, right on, the Bible says, right on top of the blood, the offering, he would get some oil and put it in his hand. And then he would anoint the same three places, the thumb, the toe, and the earlobe. Galatians 5 Verse 17 and 18 says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. So the Bible says, look, the flesh wants to go in sin. And our, our flesh gets washed in the blood, and our sins get washed away. But then the Holy Spirit needs to come and needs to show us, show us what to do and how to do things. And once you get saved, you do things differently. If you were a cheat before you got saved, you're going to be an honest man after you get saved. If you were a liar before you got saved, you should try not to lie after you get saved. You see how that works? We should, we should do God's will and the Holy Spirit helps us. Verse 25 in Galatians 5 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Well, it says walk. This talks about where you go. Where are you going, Christian? Where are the places that you go? Where do you want to go? Well, you got to go where God sends you to go. And where God allows you to go. Then there's the lobe of the ear. Revelation 3.22 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. God is speaking to the church. Every time we get up here and every time his old preacher opens his little mouth, the Holy Spirit's in there trying to do some work in your heart. Listen to the Holy Spirit of God. Yes. He has your best interest in heart. What's interesting is that there's one more thing in this picture. In, in Leviticus 14. Um, he puts the oil all over the head. Just pours whatever he doesn't use on the earlobe and stuff. He pours it on the head. Well, you can't anoint the head with blood. That'd be kind of ucky. But if you cleanse them where you go and what you do and what you hear, you can clean your own mind up. But the Holy Spirit needs to take control of your mind. That oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. And so you get you get it dumped on your head. You get it dumped on your head. Um, I didn't put that verse in here. I should have. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about this. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of what? Your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So, this leper, once he was all done with the blood and the oil, he put that, he put that oil over his head and let it drip down over his head. Um, and you know what? Uh, that's a great picture. Every day we should let the Holy Spirit kind of cleanse us. And, and then, then, then it's a picture of the filling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to use you, Christian. you got to get clean first every day. Stay clean. And, and you got to watch what you do, and you got to watch where you're going, you got to watch what you listen to, and what you think. And if you do all those things, th this is perf perfectly pictured. Then you're entering into God's society, 
And you don't have to go around saying, unclean, unclean, unclean. You can just live like everybody else does. It's been said that John Bunyan, when he was in the Bedford jail, some of his prosecutors back in London had heard rumors that he was often allowed to leave the prison, which was true. You know, he wasn't a bad man, he was a preacher. And the jailers, you know, they had they had orders from headquarters to put him in jail, but you know, they soon figured out, well, this guy ain't a criminal, he's a preacher, he loves people, he's preaching the Bible, you know. They figured out that shouldn't really be illegal. So they let him go out and do stuff. Then he'd come out, then he'd come back to the jail and sleep there. Sometimes he was gone for a couple of days. And this guy in London heard about this. So they sent an officer to Bedford to discuss the matter with the jailer. This officer was to arrive at night. On this particular night, Bunyan was at home with his family, but for some reason he got really restless. They told his wife that though the jailer had given him permission to stay till the morning, something was telling him that he should go back to the jail right then and there. So he packed his stuff up and he got back to the jail immediately. And the jailer, uninformed of, uh, of the impending arrival of the officer from London, was slightly perturbed by Bunyan's coming uh, back to the jail at so unreasonable an hour because he had to get up out of bed and let the guy back into jail. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. Why you want me to trick on him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm in mean, bed. Go away. Let me back in. But early in the morning, the messenger came and interrogated the jailer. And he said, All are your prisoners here? He said, Yes. Is John Bunyan here? He said, Yes. Let me see him. So he was called and he appeared and all went well with the interview. After the messenger was gone, the jailer said to Bunyan, Well, you may go in and out any time you think it's proper, for you know when it went to return better than I can tell you. <laughs> uh, you know, when God deals with a person, other people know that. You know that? So, the leper was clean. And he had freedom from that leprosy. Can you imagine your whole life being a leper, being cut off from everybody, living by yourself? Uh, some of them live in what they call the several city, which was a whole city of lepers. Nobody else lived there. It was separate. Nobody went there. That wasn't a leper. Because it was a place of all disease. But thinking about having to move out of that place and moving back into a regular city and a regular house and having a regular... must have been marvelous. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. It says, And now being made free from sin and become servants to God, we have your fruit unto holiness and the end of everlasting life. Freedom from sin. What a thing. I was once a sinner, but I came. Pardon to receive of my Lord. It was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. There's a new name written down in glory. Amen. And it's mine. Amen. Oh, it's mine. Let the white robe angels tell the story. A sinner has come home. Amen. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, thank you that once we were sinners, now we're clean. We're like that old leper. And God, uh, thank you that you made provision for the leper, even the poor leper. And God, you made provision for us. And Lord, as we walk down the pathway of life after we get saved, our feet get dirty and our hands get dirty from doing things and this world's a dirty place and help us to take time to, to clean up every day and get right with God and stay, stay as clean as we can so that we can serve you and you can use us Lord and God help us to tell people about the glorious freedom and healing from sin that you do in our lives bless us now as we go bring us back this evening and Lord help us to give you the honor and glory from what's done Jesus, then we pray. Amen.